Welcome to Insights, everyone. I'm Namdi Odipo. And I'm Elizabeth Omori. The president has constantly extolled the courage and bravery displayed by security agencies and service chiefs in promoting peace and order. He has also acknowledged Nigerians' current internal security challenges. But he however notes that more can be achieved in bringing law and order to various parts of the country with the full cooperation of citizens. I reckon most people understand where the president is coming from and why citizen participation is important in winning the war against insecurity in Nigeria. But yet, there is the fear and frustration which is high among citizens as well. And I'm saying this with all sense of honesty and responsibility, reflecting, of course, the moods of Nigerians, whether across class, ethnicity, and religion. We will discuss the way forward. Uh, Lisbeth, of course, is here. Uh, Lisbeth? We will also be examining the role of women in politics and we'll be taking a cue from uh, the just concluded primaries or also x-ray representations, prospects and challenges. Uh, very well, especially as we march towards um, 2023 general elections. Uh, let's kickstart this episode. I'm fascinated with the discourse on national monuments and assets and how much is being done to preserve and Look into the language issue. Thing. We have turned English to become like a pride value in our own cultural values. It's not cash transfer. It's not a COVID-19. Invasion 1897 was a deliberate, deliberate tactic. You know, many of these people coming to the urban areas now. These and applications, um, there are terms and conditions. That of course, mean, um, it is assets. the union of uh, two people, a man and a woman coming together. My name is Namdi Odipo. And I'm Elizabeth. Omori. And so we begin. Uh, President Mohamed Buhari has repeatedly called on Nigerians to get more interested in working with security agencies to tackle the myriad of challenges facing the country. But let me refresh our minds on some of the recent ones. Some Sundays ago, worshippers in the Catholic um, Church in Owo, on the state, that is, had um, just said the last prayer for the service. And as it turns out, it was their last prayer as calls were needlessly uh, murdered by persons now identified or rather suspected to be ISWAP members, I should say. There was a similar incident in Kaduna quite recently. And um, yes, we are still reeling from the kidnap of dozens of passengers on the Kaduna bound um, train. Um, there was, of course, the kidnap of the Methodist um, prelate somewhere in the southeast. And again, in the northeast, the war is still raging against insurgents. I guess the question on your mind is if there is an end in sight to all of these unwarranted killings and kidnappings. Uh, you could also ask if um, policing in Nigeria is adequate and responsive. How do we go forward for, um, from here as a people and community? Joining me to discuss this issue is Wing Commander Musa Samanu, retired, a security risk management consultant and expert. Welcome to Insider. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me today. Yeah. Well, I, I'm sure you sense the uh, palpable fear and apprehension in the air. And I'm not just talking about um, those affected in a war, whether Kaduna uh, more recently or those kidnapped or, and killed in other parts of the country, because I'm talking about all of us, you and I. I mean, the average man who does, you know, organize about the roadside, the woman who fires a car. Uh, at the end of the day, like JP Clark said, I'm sure you've read the book, um, Casualties. We are all casuals, casuals casualties all are we not yes um, we are all casualties because it affects us it affects us as individuals it affects us as community it affects us as a country and until we come together to work this out uh, we will all either swim together or mm. uh, sink together and I think that's all the message should be that is what the message is that this is uh, we all have a duty where it's a collective responsibility and we must see it as such we must see that any attack on any part of nigeria on any nigerian is an attack on all mm -hmm. and that we all have a duty to all rise up to provide all that we can within our means uh, and within our ability to ensure that we face this as a challenge to all of us. Um, the attackers know the fault lines. Mm -hmm. They know the, the tendencies for Nigerians to begin to blame one another, to point accusing fingers at one another. But isn't that happening already? 
Yes, they, they do that. They because they seem to have created that confusion. And I mean, we're now passing the buck and trading blames. And it's almost causing an ethnic divide. I mean, like exacerbating the divide already there. Well, so you see, we have to be very careful of the language that we use. We have to avoid a language of division. We have to avoid our languages that are full of hate and abuses mm. and uh, languages that have contempt for one another. Because it's when we look at those divisions in terms of those similarities, in terms of, instead of those things that unite us as a person, mm. that's when the fault lines are exacerbated because they, they, they exist. Yeah. I mean, let's face it. Let's face the fact that uh, we are Nigerians, uh, we are diverse people in terms of region, in terms of religions, in terms of tribes, and so on and so forth. But that should be the strength that yeah. we have. Because that means for every single issue, we'll have people viewing it from different perspectives. We'll have people uh, proffering solutions from different dimensions. Yeah. What it needs is for us to coordinate and to look at the strands of similarities in those uh, perspectives that we have and see how we can approach this together. Right. Now, if we do that, now that's not also, I, 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 I don't like the phrase when we say security is everybody's business. <laughs> okay. Yes, it is everybody's business, but everybody has level of responsibility in that business. It's like a company. Uh, even if it's a, a, a public liability company where there are shareholders, yes, there are major shareholders. What mm. do I mean by that? Those who's those have there are people that have major responsibility for security there are people that are stakeholders in that security industry and there are people that yes they are members of that company but they have minimum or minimal uh responsibility yeah. when it comes to security right. so it's everybody's business, business yeah. however we there are degrees of responsibilities and uh, resp uh responsibilities because the re degree of even reward is different in terms of uh, what do we get out of it, I'm not so trying to say we must codify security, but it's a reality. If one person, for example, if somebody is appointed to take charge of a certain responsibility, he has more responsibility than someone that does not have that direct responsibility in a way. Uh, so while that other person that does not have that direct responsibility, uh, that, that does not get those benefits, if there are any, um, uh, he gets the benefits because he's a member of the society, but additional benefits, no. So those that have those additional benefits mm. have higher responsibility. You know, I, 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 get, I get the sense that, yes, that there are, I mean, you, 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 like you said, you do not like the phrase security is everybody's business. But of course, I, I get the sense that you, you, you're trying to, what you're trying to convey here is that, look, uh, like, like a um, public limited company, like you referenced, uh, everybody does have a role to play. I mean, it's compartment, uh, compartmentalized. I mean, to, to an extent of your, how involved you have, and you, you've, you've clearly outlined that. But then, you, you know, in, 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 in beginning, we, 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 we tried to create a sense of who the common enemy is. And it's the common, we're, we are not enemies of ourselves. It's, well, we're talk, and I'll give you an instance. There's, there's a group now, or rather, we, we seem to have created a, a name for a certain group that we now call um, UGM, unknown gunmen. I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, suddenly it just became very popular. And but but th that's that's. Uh, I, I'm trying to identify who the enemy is here. But let me read you an excerpt from an article on the you know the May 29 publication of um, Business Day that referenced the state of insecurity in Nigeria. And it says, with the incessant attack from Boko Haram, sustained onslaughts from bandits, free flow of ransom to kidnappers, and the reign of unknown gunmen. And Nigeria is now dreaded by peace lovers across the world." End of quote. Uh, somewhere out there, Nigeria is being described as the third most insecure nation in the world. I know, like you do know, that insecurity is not peculiar to us here in Nigeria. I mean, what then makes our own case special to warrant an international toga? I think what makes us special is the level of division amongst us. Um, there are challenges, there are shootings. Uh, if you take example, the United States, for example, there are yeah. mass shootings almost, almost every, day. every day. If you look at the statistics or if you look at the numbers that have happened, you think it's a country at war. But nobody is uh, saying America is number one most insecure state. Yes, apart from that, because what do Americans report? What do they <laughs> say? 
about the insecurity that is within their states how do they project their own country now if you you need to go to any of those social media and so on and you understand how nigerians talk about nigeria how we view one another and how we view the nigerian state itself so when i mean but, but isn't that a function of the frustration that they feel so it, it is a function of that but however it goes deeper than that it goes to show what are our values what do we feel as 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 a people first of all mm -hmm. and it goes to speak of the tendency for us to point at the other mm -hmm. to kind of like try to profile the other that is different from us and say he or she is the problem and, and that so if we do that we have this tendency to be to be divided along so many fault lines and when we do that we do not only do that we project it out mm -hmm. we do not only project it have out we take we want to act on it mm. so it's something to have something to have that uh, tendency that it is divided and but to want to act on it and therefore cause harm on the other person that is different from you either because of tribe because of region or religion and so on and that is what exacerbates it and mm. that is what every outsider sees and that's what people <laughs> report out there and that's why uh, it's perception yeah if security generally is yes there is but it's more about perception if i perceive if i feel that i'm secured it will take a hell lot of effort to make me feel otherwise but the moment i feel that i'm not secured the moment i feel no matter how safe a place is i feel i'm not secured and so on and so I, so I, we have a lot of work to do to on our psyche first of all as individuals as communities and i'm happy that yesterday was father's day now why is that important <laughs> it is important because fathers have a duty to play mm. what are we ch telling our kids what are we telling our wives what are we telling our families are we exacerbating that tendency to divide to point at the other and say that these are the problems or never trust this you go to families and those are the tendencies that we we act upon and so on so when we have generations upon generation passing this hatred from one generation to the other instead of us coming together collective as one person as a family as a country to to look at these problems to proffer solutions to these problems uh, we don't so there's need for us to be more patriotic mm. there's the need for us to be more uh, tolerant of one another there is need for us to be more believing in our country Nigeria that there is the need to feel that yes is there are these challenges we can wish them away but what can happen or what makes the difference is our ability to come together as a people to say that we can surmount we can yeah. face these challenges head on let me quickly just um, run along and then um, let's talk a bit about community policing within the context of um, boosting safety and uh, security and building resilient um, systems i'm sure you're well grounded in the us versus them culture between law enforcement and the citizenry upon it i've said that until that culture is completely eroded the citizenry may never truly trust law enforcement to serve their community yes or communities there is the need to involve the community as much as possible in policing uh, in, in the security architecture and that's why i have been an advocate of what um, it's not a new concept but community-based no, security architecture um, if you look at politics and politicians when politicians want to organize uh, they have the hierarchy from the polling unit you'll be surprised that if information if any political party wants to get information to the last electorate mm. they can do that within minutes and if they want to get information also from the bottom up they could do that so why can't we arrange our security in that concept we have the electorate which is the number one or this uh, the the member of the community who is the who is the number one or at least the, the minimum level of uh, uh, factor but then you should have but at the polling units it doesn't have to be that name the polling unit the ward uh up to the local government the senatorial zone and so on and so forth so that when we create cells or centers like that that are in charge of uh, of security at certain level we also infuse the state uh, uh, state security or uh, services then you find out that information uh, and response uh, 
at the basic level we don't have to wait until something gets so bad before someone from abuja can respond to it yeah. or someone even from the uh, local government headquarters or even the state capital so it happens that from the world level there are mechanisms for response to security incidences or the issues of policing and law and order when we do that and we empower them uh, in a way that they can take those decisions, they can act, they can, they, they seem uh, to be able to do that. Then if it is beyond them, then they can escalate it upwards so that we have levels upon which people can work on security. But issues. isn't that putting structure in place now? And I get totally what you mean, putting them to the world, putting such structure to, to a level like such as the world level, local government and all of that. But in terms of trust building or building trust, how would a structure like that engender trust between the community now and law enforcement? P trust is engendered when people work together. Initially, there will be a lot of mistrust and so on. But when they see that we are working for the same goal, we are working to achieve the same thing, and this is for the betterment of the society, you find out that gradually that trust will begin, or that uh, element of mistrust will begin to uh, wither away. And also for security agencies, uh, there must be that realization that you are working for the people. Mm. And the people are your employers in the real sense, and anything that you're doing, uh, it's for the. It's supposed to be for the benefit of the people. Uh, don't feel that I or we are the people uh, with the, all the solutions. No, the people nearest to a problem have the solution to that problem. What you can do from outside or from in, in terms of authority is in terms of gathering that, coordinating it, and making effective response. So until the security uh, forces see that. Uh, they have a duty to be friendly. And in fact, that when they are friendly uh, with the society, with the community, that it gets their jobs done better, Easy, yes, better, faster, and more effective. Because when people have trust in you, that's when they are able to give you information. That's mm. when they will be able to report incidences Naturally. to you. That's when they will be able to assist you when there's a problem. Uh, when they don't feel that you're going to turn your guns against them or you're going to turn your elements of power against them uh, that's when uh, they will be uh, confident that you're here for them and they can partner with you uh, in an enterprise of providing security and this is what makes the security for all uh, security is a business of all a really living uh, or worth saying uh, not the way we just say it but we we only say it when there's a problem we don't share with the communities and the glory when something good is happening we don't tell them hmm. we don't communicate effectively with them we stay just apart and assume that they should understand what we're doing no they don't understand there should be better reaching out there should be better means of communication and there should be greater involvement of the communities and the security challenges and how to solve those problems within the communities you know i, I like your take on uh, another highly complex uh, i mean i mean not, not well and not highly complex but there is also the issue of the highly complex landscape of vigilantes and anti-crime and militia groups in parts of the country and their involvement in current efforts at um, securing nigeria why some are recognized and formalized uh, at least to some extent by state level authorities others receive no recognition or payment from the state and some even represent ethnic groups I, I don't want to mention names there but I mean you of course you know what I'm talking about I recognize that some of these groups develop political ca capital over time with local communities but isn't their profound lack of accountability uh, a, a, another challenge at another level for Nigeria's internal security so you see these groups are ch uh, 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 if, if I will give them a plural children of necessity <laughs> yeah. communities have found that there is a gap between the formal policing uh, structure and the requirement of the co police so people uh, sorry and the requirements of the communities or their security needs so people have decided or people decided through uh, informal mechanisms to come up with systems that they feel work to protect themselves now um that that there's that tendency for humans to try to self-preservation is the first law of nature they mm. say now um, when people do that the state has a responsibility to identify those gaps to identify those groups that have been created first they were created because of 
the lack of or the absence of the state itself or the state mechanism so when that has become a reality that has to be lived with i give an example of uh civilian jtf in 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 the fight against boko haram and even in the, uh, the in the northeast and also similar vigilante and the hunters and so on and so forth and this still goes back to the fact that i was saying the community-based security architecture those guys are based in the communities they know virtually everybody so what you should do is to absorb them into a kind of formal system mm. and give them a training training is very important give them a structure and say and absorb them into something that makes them very accountable you can't wish them away hmm. they're even in groups like the hunters groups yes even groups like the look every every organization they have some level of organization what you can do is to formalize that organization is to train that organization okay. is to make them under a kind of uh, a kind of platform where you can influence where you can make them responsible where you can make them to be accountable to, for their actions when you train them when you make them accountable when you are the one that take off certain responsibilities and make them part of a system you find out that their excesses will be curtailed Okay, great. So you, you talk about um, absorbing groups like this. I have a final question for you. We're, we're out of time totally. I would appreciate if uh, you just very quickly just sure. um, express yourself. So, I, I'm, of course, you know about um, government's multi-sector approach, you know, to carbon insecurity. But, you know, it, it makes me wonder, I've wondered over some time, if perhaps uh, traditional religion has any role in internal security. And I'll give you an example. In my village, there's a masquerade that we call, um, it, 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 you, you don't see it the human eyes it's called ligi ligi you know when this master and we don't call him is a spirit more or less you know he comes out he presents itself only at midnight and stays till like early hours of the morning and no one dares come out or come out to do anything i mean you, you don't even hear of stuff like stealing you can you can't even there i mean this is very akin to what happens in the southwest like I, i'm sure you know about the oro in southwest nigeria i mean can but my question really is can we not modify some of these traditional practices and deploy them in a manner that promotes peace i mean peace building activities a targeting crime reduction no everybody is important in this every culture every every belief that people yes. have every structure within the community can be useful it all depends on how we're able to like i said earlier on absorb it into okay. a kind of codified formal system okay. whereby there are do's and don'ts so you're not there appalled, are boundaries you're not appalled at, at bringing in traditional or religion uh, i mean traditional religion into the security architecture you're not i'm oh, surprised you're not appalled no i'm not because it's a way of life of the people it's a reality you can't wish it away now, some people you, will think it's ludicrous uh, but it, it why you think it's ludicrous is because perhaps you feel that they are not accountable to someone so what i'm saying is that we can get them to be accountable you mm. can get them into a system and create a kind of do's and don'ts okay. create a kind of reporting mechanism okay. create a kind of say that this is what is acceptable this is not what every culture modifies a certain time mm. uh, culture goes through some kind of modification and so on when we do that when we look at the good parts of that culture and we say okay this is acceptable this can get into one then we find out that people even trust it more People, I tell you, the people in your village will believe or trust that yeah. more than the normal, formal security architecture. Uh, unfortunately, the, all of that doesn't really happens these days. I mean, uh, it's called modernization now. Uh, and so um, cultural um, festivities like that have been put in the back burner. Uh, and so, I mean, you see cases of theft. And uh, these things never used to happen back in the days of my grandma and my grandpa. I mean, all of that has changed now. Wing Commander Musa Salmano retired. I would like to thank you so much for coming on Insight. It's, this has been a delight. It's been a very good interaction on this very uh, core issue of internal security in Nigeria. I'd like to appreciate you all so much for coming on Insight. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I look forward to having more of these discussions with you in the future. Thank you. Well, it is election season and we're seeing political intrigues, offensive and counter-offensive um, playing out in the political arena. Allegations of vote buying are some of the fallouts from the just-concluded governorship elections in um, Ekiti State.
What does that present for future elections in Nigeria, especially the fast approaching 2023 national polls? My next guest is Frederick Akweji, public affairs analyst. He joins me here in the studio to discuss this matter. Welcome to Insight. Thank you very much. Well, we, we in the past, we, we used to see ballot box um, snatching. We do not see all of that now and attacks at polling stations as we used to in the distant past. Is it that the system has improved? Or rather, we have moved from that to a more sophisticated level of rigging elections through vote buying. Uh, and again, is this a having yeah, of what could happen in the 2023 general elections? And, and are we gradually heading to an, a state where the, whether the man or the woman with the most money wins election in Nigeria? Thank you very much. Let me start by, by saying I appreciate you having me on your show this afternoon, the subject of election, especially this forthcoming election, and how voters are being induced by money is a subject that I feel very strongly about. So when I got this invitation to come and be a part of this program, I embraced the invitation very warmly mm. because I believe that so we'll we, need to to speak up, we need to speak up as many of us that are speaking up about this subject, the better for this country. Now, if you look at what happened in Ekiti State over the weekend, in the recently held governorship election there. It's not just allegation. There were people on videos, on, on video screens, on all over social media, attesting to the fact that they were bribed to vote. In fact, there was one that said they had 10,000, some other person said they had 5,000, some other person said they had 7,000. This, if you ask me, is very pathetic. This is not the direction in which you should be going at all. It's been 23 years, it's going to be 24 years next year that we have been in the Fourth Republic. It's a long enough time for us to have been able to perfect our electoral systems and our electoral culture beyond what we are still having today. Now, even before this election in Ekiti, you will recall that even during the primaries, the presidential election primaries of the two biggest parties, that's APC and PDP respectively, this issue also came up about bribing delegates this time around voter to, inducement yes voter inducement basically mm. you know mm. this is a culture that is well entrenched in our country today and we need to uproot it we don't need it it is not healthy at all it is not healthy at all when political office holders when political office seekers go that route they are simply saying they do not believe in their own capacity to win elections if they believe they are good enough, why induce people? And what, what does the voter believe, if, if that's the belief of the politician? Now, the voter himself, the voter herself, they to also feel a sense of, hey, whether they are elected or they are not elected, after all, nothing is going to come to me. The ones that were elected four should years ago, Should the voter ago, have any benefit? sense of entitlement in collecting money from a politician? I mean, do you, I mean, okay, no, this money, after all, is our money. And I'm just taking it from this politician now because after all, this is the only thing I'll probably get. Is that the right sense of entitlement? I, I would think that, okay, I should be entitled to asking questions like, look, why is the road in my local government or the road that leads to my house bad when you have been there in the Senate for four years and nobody is talking about this bad road? Why is it that um, I have not seen power in the last two weeks? Like I have not seen power now in the last two weeks in my area. I mean, shouldn't that be the question that the man is asking instead of going there to collect 10,000 naira? You know, if you ask me, it is not because the voters are feeling entitled to it, but rather it is because of desperation. There is hunger in the land. A lot of people do not appreciate the magnitude of Nigeria's financial challenges. Amongst the countries with the biggest population, that have a population of 100 million people and above. Amongst all of those countries, Nigeria, Bangladesh, Pakistan, these are very wretched countries. Their economies have stagnated over the years, especially Nigeria. We are not even talking about our economy has stagnated. We are also wasteful. We are also very inefficient, even with the resources that we have. Imagine the huge amount of money that the federal government is compelled to channel into paying for petroleum subsidies. If that sector was run well, who would have to pay anybody subsidies? 
so, so refineries are working. So, so poverty. So in, a, in, in a nutshell, yes. the conclusion I'm drawing is it is not as if Nigerians feel a sense of we are entitled to you to, I mean, we are entitled to the 5,000 or 10,000 or whatever amount it is that you are giving me so that I can vote for you. But rather, I think what is driving that is desperation, is hunger in the land. And it's been like this for a long time and it is worsening. So nothing will change if we continue to struggle with um, poverty. Honestly, if I wish, uh, I wish we could get people that really want to serve this country. I wish we could get them somehow, anyhow, to be the ones that the political parties themselves will pop up. But the people and deserve make the kind of the leadership people. that they get. You and I could be leaders. You could very well be the president tomorrow. I don't. Have I mean, it. our leaders are drawn from amongst us. So, are we? Yes, I granted there are economic issues. It's not peculiar to us. Granted, our people are poor. No, I've seen poverty at at some level, and it's made me marvel as well. So, I am not. I mean, denied, and I will not be naive here. But my point is that shouldn't we, as a people, at this point, I mean, embrace? You know the collective will to move ourselves forward and yes so that we can actually achieve the kind of change that we want and that we truly deserve i don't intend to market anybody on this program no of course not that's not what we're doing but we're there is something that i think is quite profound that has happened in the last two so, three weeks and i get the sense of where you're going you're yes. saying look we leadership can inspire change yes that's exactly what you're saying yeah granted i'll let that land there but look now, you referenced those who you saw on social media, you know, collecting money. So now we have seen pictures of EFCC arresting people involved in vote buying during yeah. the elections. Yes. That is a good sign, I should think. It's a beautiful sign. Okay, so we know there are laws that discourage voter voters' inducement and other electoral offenses, you know, that you know for, that should follow following the, or after the arrest of offenders. Should we expect at this point, at this level that we had, that allegations of party, such as party involvement, and how it connects to suspects in custody, should also be investigated? I think so. If you look at the way the parties are structured today, they themselves don't have very strong internal systems mm. that help to checkmate such frauds. I mean, We've all been in this country, even if you're not already born as at the time of the First Republic, you've heard stories of the First Republic. Yes. Political parties in the First Republic were far better structured. They had far better systems. They were more deeply entrenched in the country in terms of values, in terms of, I mean, what they brought to the table, in terms of helping to drive political systems that are really in the direction of service not just going there to go and amass money. You ask yourself, for instance, in the First Republic, the political parties that we had then, they were structured in such a way that they could checkmate themselves. We usually hear stories about how, you know, the top guns in those political parties, they themselves were selfless people. They were going to become political leaders out of selflessness out of a desire to serve the public and all of that but you don't see that in this fourth republic i'd like to ask you about um, some appraiser by cso's that um, civil society groups you know commending INEC in terms of deployment of equipment and personnel uh, for the akiti election more so uh, it is being reported that nearly 88 percent of centers were ready as at 8 30 a.m on election day do you think as a litmus test for for INEC and uh, the electoral Act 2022. Do you think uh, INEC is heading down the right trajectory as we move towards 2023? You know, generally speaking in Nigeria, over the past several years, INEC has been a whipping child. I mean, we whip INEC all the time. <laughs> we criticize INEC. You INEC think they don't the deserve it? But honestly, again, when you look very carefully, I think INEC itself has achieved some milestones Indeed. in recent times. Indeed. I know INEC has deployed technology in the a beavers. very extensive way yes. to help manage elections. Yes. And I think we are seeing positive results along those lines. If you go to the INEC website, it's not even just one INEC website. It's not even just the INEC website that just contains the information about INEC. That's a standard website. But it has other platforms that it uses to engage voters, it uses to manage the registration process for voters and so on and so forth. And if you go to those portals, on the internet and you see what INEC has deployed there honestly 
Let us give a little thumbs up to INEC. So they don't have any work to do anymore? They have to do. They <laughs> have to do. Now, I've talked about how INEC has done well in terms of deploying technology. But let me also say that at times you could deploy technology. But the second thing is, will the technology be maximized? I think the staff of INEC, the area that they need to up their game is in the area of maximizing the technology. Because right now, you ask yourself, I'm here in Abuja, for instance, this is where I live. But I'm from Edo State. By the time the elections roll over, why do I need to travel all the way to Edo State? Four hours, five hours by road, just to go and cast my vote. You compare it to banking. I have an ATM card. With that ATM card for my bank, whichever area, wherever they have an ATM stand, yes. or wherever but, they but have that, a bank branch, I can that's, just go there and transact That's a business. function of law now, and then um, that will be maybe in future okay, okay. amendment of the electoral I, I, I know, I, I know that has can, to do with yes, legislation, but yes. I just raised that when I say INEC today. Yeah. I believe that what is the biggest challenge before INEC today is to internally strengthen their staff. So you're giving them a pass mark, pass mark on the Kitty election? I'm giving I, I, INEC a, a pass mark on the Kitty election, Great. definitely. Fantastic. When it comes to the way the people themselves responded, I mean the bribery, the inducement for voters, of course, that, that, those, those, those ones are there. ugly. Yeah. Those ones are ugly sides of it. But in terms of what INEC put on ground, brought to the table to manage this election in the Giddy State, it wasn't bad at all. In fact, people could see as those results were being uploaded. uploaded yes, and what do you think INEC about website. that? People, INEC were just, very, yes. people were very excited. I mean, we did not have, to, were see, very we did not have to see staff now traveling from one village to the local government yes. commission center before, you know, submitting the, the, the results already entered. Now they just uploaded straight from the polling stations. I, 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 honestly, we need to give that to INEC is clearly a pass mark. When we talk about the culture of our elections generally, I mean the inducement and all of that, we can see that those are ugly sides of it. Mm. But in terms of what INEC brought to the table for these equity elections, let's give them a little thumbs up. Uh, let me take of you course, up. Let's challenge them to do better, to up their game sure. when it comes to sure. deploying the technology, managing it better and all that. Well, I'd like to take you up on the issue of um, uh, voter mobilization. I mean, the total number of cast and um, vote cast um, in the Kitty election is indicative of, um, you know, of um, just, especially young persons, how they, they seem to have removed themselves from elections. But when we talk about voter apathy, what purpose is this serving? Is it sending a message to the political class or we are generally losing out as a people? Voter apathy did not start today. Voter apathy also doesn't start. Apathy usually doesn't start. Usually it is not one thing that makes people be to become, that drives people towards apathy. It's usually a culmination of different things. If you look at the beginning of the Fourth Republic from 1999, the 1999 elections, nobody could really fault it because it was organized by the military. Mm. There was no rigging, so to say, if you understand what I'm talking about. Because it was managed by the military, they were handing over to the civilians for the first time in a long while. But from the 2023 elections, we could begin to see all kinds of ugliness, all kinds of rigging on a massive scale. Those things discourage voters. You will see people go to polling booths and you hear tales of people mm. being killed. Cutlasses and guns being brought out, people being macheted. Those things discourage people. In the 2027 elections, I recall, that was the second term of the former president, President Chief, Chief, Chief Olusha Mwabasanjo, when he was rounding up his second term tenure, one of his best friends, one of his best all-time friends, globally speaking, President Jimmy Carter of the United States, he gave a thumbs down to the Nigerian government for that election. As far as he was concerned, it was a failed election. Someone that was that close to Mwabasanjo, for him to say publicly that he was giving a thumbs down, I mean, you could imagine how much corrupted such an exercise was. You could imagine how terrible such an exercise was. So a culmination of all of these series of elections from 2003 till date have made, have caused the apathy that we are seeing today. Honestly. Because people don't even believe that if we vote in these people and they come to power and they become president or governors or federal well, state we've, lawmakers, we've just they, really, they, they wouldn't we've really just referenced us. some positives and um, we, we've also talked about the need for things to change and we can only achieve this change ourselves. Shouldn't that be enough to move people, especially young persons, to not just register but to actually participate in the votes proper? You know, 
It is going to. It teach. is not God that will come down and cast the vote Absolutely, for us. Absolutely, I agree with you. So, Absolutely, it has to be done by Nigeria. But you know, it's going to take. I tell people, I say, the wheel of political progress matches on very sluggishly. Mm. You don't expect things to just happen at the snap of the fingers. You will invest in systems. You will invest in culture. When I say culture, I'm not mean. I mean culture in the way things are done in Nigeria generally when it comes to election. You will invest in such things, and then little by little, consistently, you begin to see better results. Mm. If you're talking about youth involvement, the youths are ready. I know there is a particular candidate in town today who has generated so much buzz. And that has led INEC itself they, they are all to generating. even acknowledge. They are all generating. Yes. All of the candidates are generating. We are not, <laughs> to even we are cannot be particular to. There is, there I, is I think for every there candidate is an out there, in, <laughs> for, for every candidate the out there, 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 is, there, is, to there is a but to very, become very, voters. Very right? quickly, let, let me, yep. I mean, since we're on the subject of our party and all of that and getting involved in the electoral process, you know, we, we know in Nigeria voting is a, is a, is a civil right. The civic rights. Yeah, it is an obligation. Yeah. It is not compelled by law. Yeah. So we're getting. Are we not getting to a point where, uh, as it is done in some climes, where there are similar cases of um, apathy, uh, where state actors, whether at national or subnational levels, give legally legally approved incentives to citizens to vote and participate in the elections to increase um, turnout. Those such incentives are not necessary. The kind of things that we encourage people to vote is their own convictions that to polit political officers that have been voted for mm. are coming into power and they are serving the people. Are you afraid that, that it might be politicized in Nigeria? Those things cannot. On what basis are you even going to implement such things? What what incentives are you going to put in place? Are some some countries actually some some countries actually pay some countries actually pay stipends to voters for for, <laughs> for voting. I don't think I don't think we need any such thing. So they won't achieve any sustainable result. I mean, you can't sustain such a thing. Mm. I mean, in any case, in a country like Nigeria where we are dying of hunger, is that where our priority <laughs> is to put money to encourage people to vote? When we should put money to encourage our power systems to pop up? So that people can produce, or we can help clean up the system in terms of this crisis, this banditry, insurgency, and all of that, that is basically stopping people from going to the farms. Mm, mm. And I, all of that. I, 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 I don't think we should carry money, take money to come and induce voters to vote. No, 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 Appreciate but rather the thing that will encourage voters yeah. to keep voting to turn out in larger and larger numbers is if they see more and more credible people come to office Very well. and that you can't do in one election cycle but Very you have well. to desire it you have to gradually begin to put such a culture in place mm. so that maybe after two three election cycles one mm. election cycle in nigeria is four years I, I, so when i say two three election cycles i'm still like in I, eight I do, years I do, 10, I agree 12 with years, you. people will begin to feel a lot more confident then they will come into the voters net in larger numbers yes. in minimum millions that we have today I'd like to, and I'd when like they to... do vote and when they do register to vote they will make every effort on election days to go out to actually go and do the vote casting uh, frederick Akbeju, i'd like to thank you so much for coming on insight it's been a delight i mean a pleasure having you yeah your thoughts on this issue uh, somewhat profound i should say thank you so much for coming on Insight. I, yeah. I hope we'll, we'll be able to bring you here uh, um, some of the time so I can take you up on other issues like when you referenced um, uh, political parties in First Republic Nigeria and you talked about the structure and value and ideology at the time. Uh, I'd like to take you up on that issue and then um, uh, perhaps bring up the flip side of what happened in the First <laughs> Republic with political as parties well. Uh, as well. Thank you so much for coming on Insight. It's my pleasure. Thank you so very much. I I'm very delighted to be here and mm. I wish you a very wonderful day. Thank you. Thank Elizabeth you so Omori is up next. Nigeria has been recording low participation of women in both elective and appointive positions. This is a growing concern to many Nigerians. However, concerted efforts have been made by government and non-governmental organizations to increase the level of participation of women in politics in line with the declaration made at the fourth world conference on women in Beijing. the inclusion of women in political processes is a key element in achieving an inclusive democracy and women must have the chance to exercise their political rights and participate in all political decision making 
Recently, the number of female aspirants is a far cry compared to men that officially declared their presidential ambitions. Women who made their intentions known pulled out or don't make it at the primaries. Why are women underrepresented? What are the factors responsible for this? And why do women give up easily on their political ambitions? These are some of the questions my guest will answer on this segment. And Dr. Karo Musso is our guest, the presidential aspirant of African Action Congress. Thank you so much, Doctor, for joining us on the program. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very pleased to be here. This is one of my family's NTA. Thank you so much. Now, let's take uh, cues from various primaries conducted by political parties recently. What are your thoughts? Um, honestly speaking, uh, just about the time we, the women, uh, thought we have understood the process of uh, being elected in the field, uh, new innovations emerges, taking the women on our ways. So that's one of the uh, issues that women dealt with this time around. We thought we had prepared. We, we thought we had mobilized. We thought the system would be fair. We thought the godfathers are looking after us or godmothers are looking after us. But in the field, honestly speaking, uh, I feel like um, I have dropped from uh, heaven. But the, the women that came out of this time, they were really prepared. They worked hard, they reached out, they consulted far and near. They were really um, not on the high issues, we were on the canvases, consulted across the country like every other man out there. But what we saw on the field and what we saw on the election day was, to say the least, beyond our reach. But the women still mobilized for the men. So where, what is the problem? One problem is money. Okay. Second problem, money. Third problem, money. I know for sure none of our uh, women had 100 million to pay. Hmm. Well, they say it's uh, free. But I didn't in the game know that it wasn't free. But that's what they call uh, a special of interest fund. You must pay it five million. Hmm. That's what they call a uh, special of um, a nomination form. That's where they say, okay, some parties say you pay half. But by the time they add levies, uh, the form you didn't fit properly, uh, the way they didn't go yesterday, or the men went, 10 million naira is out there. There are not too many women who can afford it. They put that aside. They start talking about the money to do consultation across the country. 36 states. Very, very important. FCC. It's not there. Then you are talking about the gang up. He didn't do anything, no? but they will hit you to your toe. That, is, that one is there. Then you talk about the money to uh, mobilize the delegates. The money is not there. No. <laughs> Where will women get that money? So there's another one is that. The women who are other political parties, unfortunately, will tell you up front, I can't support you because you're not in my political party. Mm. So the women got tired of reaching out to women organizations or the women uh, speakers or women leadership in the community. They will ask you to bring money. That was our, our own uh, uh, pitfall and uh, difficult in the field, not having the support of the women themselves. It was so pronounced this time around. I thought we have worked on it up to a level. But what, what you experience in the field, you're on your own. It means that the economic strength and power not there at all. No. But what does this portend for our democracy and politics? Dangerous. Oh. Dangerous. Both we, the women in the field, and the umpires that are supposed to protect us are uh, missing in action. So you just uh, want nest. So the women are out there on their own. And when you say they don't fight for themselves, we have to talk to ourselves, the system, the judiciary, the administrative, the umpire. Let's go out there, shake it out, let them checkmate what happened. Is it true you came in today? 
you want to be uh, uh, because he came in the night jumped through the window through the roof he carried money maybe he has uh, been sacked from one political party that he didn't get ticket to come there is a process you have to go through to come to the level of your an aspirant oh. did he go through that i said no and many of them happen like that aside the uh financial status of women most women in the country are there other factors responsible for women giving up so easily you know um we don't get enough training okay which sensitization yes and which both local women organizations government the foreign agencies they need to step in i attend the only one seminar or conference which i didn't really get what is needed for women to know what to do at any given time that was lacking honestly speaking and when you don't know apprehension comes in and when yeah. apprehension comes in you are completely break down so there must be more of that way in advance not when the elections are two months a month and then uh, we start running around but at that point people, some people don't assimilate that much yeah uh -huh. and when the seminar comes and nobody's out there say let's support with the money other than just uh talk show finish and everybody goes on there has to be a way of supporting women financially whether it's a government whether it's an internal organization whether it's international organization there has to be one we need to put our system together all of us we should stop playing this play play along no this country is so gifted so uh, nourished by gifts i'm asking every nigerian every every nigerian go get your pvc mm -hmm. no woman no nation. no nation it's only a mother can look around and say my people are hungry and you run around and find something to fix it it's only a mother can look around and say my family is in chambo let me find a way to put it together how do we now foster our political ambitions when you empower a woman you power a nation talk less of his state or his community so you can power more people who can be in business make money so that one time comes this woman will have money so i'm putting this amount of money mm -hmm. to support this person the same thing with youths our youths are they're not poor but financially they are poor they have all that god has given them but that money because it seems like we are keeping them down when it comes to finance issues Already, do you see women fully independent politically? Nigerian women are very smart, very intelligent, and very considerate of the building the nation as a whole, not just her or her family. A woman can become a president. I have the belief, I have the confidence it will happen very near. 2023 20, general elections, uh, preparations are on top gear, parties are warming up. What would be your words to Nigerian women in terms of representation? Coming towards that 2023, if you don't have your PVC, don't complain. Use your PVC to send the message. Hmm. If you're not inside and you're outside, use your PVC. Because when it comes to decision making, agriculture, women can climb uh, tractors, mechanize uh, uh, farming. You can do the same thing, but you have somebody who can make the policy or help you uh, who, are, who are in a legislative area who can make policy that this money should be given to these people and this equipment must be given to women, to youth, to go into farming. They must be in ICT, manufacture this, uh, fabricate this machine. Believe me, if you go to these uh, countries, they say they are in, in top of the world. Believe me, Nigerians and Nigerian youth can do better if we invest in them. Believe me, if you put women in this government, believe me, and God may say answer our prayer, this country will be 360 degrees towards upward mobility, and our country will be better. Because if, if somebody fits well, you won't be thinking about crime. If somebody is enough in manufacturing something, you won't be thinking about crime. I'll use who and Yahoo Yahoo. For what now? Hand them over something, not gone. Hand them over manufacturing, education, uh, if they can't spare. Please give them vocational education. They can manufacture. Of course. That's what we want. A country whose people are not educated. Believe me, that country is in trouble. Dr. Caro Unwoso, Presidential Aspirant, African Action Congress. Thank you so much for your thoughts on Insight this week. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you so much.
educational deprivation is not the end of the world. Agencies and stakeholders to proactively tackle these challenges. We know. Women in most countries of the world constitute about 50% of registered voters. Kevin Williams reporting for Dateline 360. In Jaws, Caleb Gochin, Deadline 360. Deadline 360. Shidi Okrafo. For Deadline 360. In Lagos, Michael Olaleye. Reporting for Deadline 360. I am Omosola Omojola. Thanks for tuning in. And that's it on this episode of the program. Do join us same time next week for more on Insights. My name is Namdi Odipo. And I'm Elizabeth Omori. See you next week.